Okay, so welcome, Dave. Or should I say the Florida lawman? Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's talk about, if you would, Judge Cannon and her handling of Trump's stolen document case. Because Trump employee number five feared that she was about to release the names of the government's witnesses. So he went to the press and basically he beat her to the punch. How bad is this for Trump? Well, it's bad, but I think it's also bad for Judge Cannon because Judge Cannon was, as you correctly said, about to release the names of witnesses and, and putting them at risk. And this guy said, hey, I'm going to get ahead of this. I'm not going to let you dictate when I have to worry about my family and be concerned. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to announce who I am and I'm going to do it on my terms. So I thought that was a pretty shrewd move. And it also is pretty damning evidence against Trump because... As we know, it's not about the possession of the documents. It's about the refusal to give them back. It's about the obstruction, stupid. So when people say, right. well, Pence and Biden did the same thing, no, and this witness is evidence of that. Yeah, and look, I fully understand. I probably more than anybody or many people who were in Trump's orbit, when your name comes out, there's 70% of the country hates Trump. And that's why I don't believe any of these polls. But that 70%, if you are aligned with Trump, attack you to, no, to the nth degree. But then there's that 30 to 40%, right, that are true Trump supporters, diehards, that attack you even worse. So I understand the rationale by Brian Butler in terms of coming out and beating her to the punch. Yeah. You know, I admire his courage to go on an outlet like CNN. He could have done it in different ways, but he decided to say, I'm going to just go out there, lead with my chin. If you want to come at me, come at me. And he is an important witness because although he did not see the documents themselves, he does go to the point of obstruction because they're loading up the boxes as the feds are descending on uh, their property, they're loading the boxes to send it to Bedminster so that the feds don't see it. That's pretty bad. Well, it certainly shows intent, right? In terms of with the documents, we all know that when he said it was like 16 plus boxes that he loaded up, I thought he answered Caitlin Collins extremely well. And I was on Laura Coates that night responding to a secondary question that she had which was, why didn't he ask what was in the box? Why didn't he sort of question? And I said to her, you're joking, right? You don't right. question Donald Trump, right? The guy who is your boss in terms of what's inside the boxes. Your job, this guy Brian's job, was to deal with the cars. And he was tasked with taking those boxes from that room and sticking it into a vehicle, sending it to the plane to load it up. And so exactly. all he did was what he was tasked. You know, Brian Butler was not Trump's chief of staff. He's not his CFO. He's not Byrne, the guy who runs Mar-a-Lago. He, he's a guy who helps with things like this. And so he's, it's not in his job description to start questioning the boss and asking what's inside these banker boxes. And I know it looks like he could be the chief of staff because he was dressed really impeccably. He looked like he'd be- Well, he looked like he was dressed like he was Donald. He, he had the extremely long red tie that right. basically covered your nutsack, right? <laughs> Although, I mean, it was literally down to his ankles, which is, I don't know why Trump wears the extra, extra long ties, but he clearly gave this guy the tie. And it was the identical color blue suit. Which is why people thought, well, why didn't you question him? You must be equals. No, he's not an equal. Just because he dresses like him doesn't make him an equal. So I'm with you. I thought that was that question uh, was uh, answered itself, essentially. Yeah. You know, it's and again, going back to I, I, I can't tell you how many text messages and emails from haters. I mean, talk about like Trump supporting haters and so on. So that I literally as I'm talking to you, I just got one. Um, I won't say what this guy's account is, uh, but the response that I got is, fuck you, traitor, snitch, and all-around cocksucker. I mean, 
I will now delete that. All right. Um, then followed by a guy who goes under a username and I have no idea who he is. Fuck you. No one gives a fuck what you say. You're a fucking turncoat Jew piece of shit. Mm. Hey, I have many issues with these type of um, comments and these sort of text messages uh, and social media posts that come. So I actually applaud this guy for beating her to the punch. I don't understand why she did it. Do you? Why, uh, Judge Cannon or ju uh, who, who Judge? Judge Cannon. Why was why she? Why was she willing to release the names of these individuals that are clearly either redacted yeah. or disguised so as to provide anonymity? Yeah. When it comes to Judge Cannon, her history is as a former assistant U.S. attorney, she has been pro-prosecution, except when it comes to defendant Donald Trump. Then all of a sudden, she's more like Better Call Saul. You know, she does <laughs> she, she, do, she does seem to give a lot of deference to the former president. In fact, in one of her earlier rulings about the special master, she made a point of saying that he does get special treatment because he is a former president, and then the 11th Circuit repudiated her and embarrassed her, and I thought she'd be chastened by it. And there have been some rulings where she has ruled for Jack Smith, but then you have stuff like this where she's about to release the names and Jack Smith is pleading with her, please reconsider. Don't do this. Once you undo, once you do it, it can't be undone. And so I think that in the end, she probably does not release this stuff or else she knows she'll be appealed to the 11th Circuit. They could eventually remove her from the case. And I know a lot of people are wondering, why hasn't Jack Smith asked her to be recused? So but that's the actually that, the question I would like to actually ask you next. I mean, what can Jack Smith actually do to finally shut Judge Cannon down? I mean, if she's removed from the case, could it be reassigned and possibly this case be heard before the election or the cutoff date before the election? There is a 0% chance that this case will be heard before the election because you have a new judge and Judge Cannon who's also giving Trump a lot of his extensions that he's asked for, the delays that he's asked for, and she gets a lot of discretion as a judge to develop the calendar. So she's not going to get removed for that. But if she continues to make uh, decisions that are not within the law, then she could be removed. But the standard is that uh, it's got to be a, a bias that is objectively uh, that it definitely exists. That it's got to be obvious to a neutral observer. But even though it does look like it exists here, it's really a high burden, and that's why Jack Smith hasn't requested it yet because he knows he probably would not win, and it would just piss off the judge more, and it would build in more delays. So this case is not going to be heard before the election, and it's not only because it's Judge Cannon; it's also because. It does involve some SEPA issues, this federal law that governs these classified documents. So mm -hmm. ironically, Michael, the case that I believe is the strongest against Donald Trump, which is this case, the Mar-a-Lago documents case, is also the least likely to be heard before the election. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. He, meaning Donald Trump, has been absolutely brilliant in terms of creating delay. Not in terms of the way that he's gone about any of this stuff with the various charges and the counts, the 94 counts that have been raised against him. In fact, three counts today have been dismissed by Judge McPhee in the Fulton County, Georgia case. Can you explain to my listeners what was going on? Because while that was happening, I was actually down by the DA's office today just reviewing some documents for the upcoming March 25th case. Yeah. This is just three of the several counts against him uh, in Georgia, and it doesn't affect the RICO counts, which really are the big whammy in Georgia. So of these three counts that are not that are now dropped, they can be refiled, and she'd have yes. to go back to the grand jury to do it, which would delay matters, but she could do that. Or she could just drop them entirely, and there's plenty of other counts That'll continue against Trump. Uh, so I don't think this is that big of a deal. It's just that Judge McAfee, who I think actually has done a decent job so far, he, there's nothing to indicate he has any bias in this case. Uh, Judge McAfee said that the prosecution didn't do a good enough job 
explaining the details of these counts because you've got to give the defense enough information so they can build a defense. So because it was too vague, he's going to dismiss it and say that prosecution, if you want to refile or get a new indictment, you can mm -hmm. do so. So so she has, uh, Fonnie Wills has a few options, go back to the grand jury or she could drop uh, that matter or she could appeal. Uh, Judge McAfee did give yep. leave if, if she wanted to appeal, but uh, two out of those three choices involve more delays. So I think she just may move on. Yeah, what was also interesting is that these three counts really deal more with like Rudy Giuliani, Eastman and others than it does with Donald Trump. It had to do with the with the uh, fake electors um, and the scheme within which to put right. the fake electors into the state. And so on. I thought initially when I saw that uh, those counts brought by Fannie Willis, I thought they were very interesting charges. I was curious in terms of how one goes about even proving that. Right. Um, look, I don't know that case. Um, you know, to the extent that I know information on others. So I, I was always curious to see how that would pan out. Now, I'm with you on that. I don't think she refiles. I don't think that they take it on appeal. The bad part about all of this is that Trump and his team will declare a victory. You see, I told you, one by one, day by day, count by count, charge by charge, we are winning. Sounds like Alina Haba, right? You know, we are winning. <laughs> yeah, we are. You know, Donald Trump did nothing wrong. Hence why, you know, Judge McAfee, who is not a Trumper, just ruled in his favor. These are the things that they do. Moreover, another thing that Donald does is he turns around and he will now start sending out um, emails and text messages to supporters claiming that he won and that I need more help from you financially in order to keep up the fight because we are winning. That's the saddest part. You know, he claimed exoneration after the Senate refused to uh, convict him in the first impeachment, exoneration. And, uh, you know, he can claim whatever he wants, but, uh, you know, the facts are, are different. This does not clear him of anything except for the fact that the prosecution said that those three counts need to be more specific, you need to do better. And that's all it is. And here's my prediction, Michael. Mark my words, that if you're worried about how the public perceives the dismissal of these counts, don't worry, because in about, what, 48 hours, this is going to be washed away because Judge McAfee is expected to make the real consequential ruling, mm -hmm. the ruling on whether D.A. Fonnie Willis gets to stay on the case. And if he, whatever he rules, that's going to dominate. So Trump will end up hating this judge if he keeps her on the case and all the exoneration stuff will go by the wayside. And if he does remove her, then that's going to be the real exoneration. That's the end of this right. case for him, even though it's not the end of the case, but it does gravely wound it if Fonnie Willis is indeed removed. What's your prediction on that? Oh, man. I think I think it's 50-50. I know that's a cop-out, but here's here's my take. I do think that yeah, the judge I'm will gonna, try I'm to... I'm going to agree with you on that. It's a cop-out. Here, cop <laughs> here on May Here on May Culpa, we talk, you know, we talk tough. We talk raw, unfiltered. Well, that's a fucking here, cop-out. Here's, here's my good, thing. That's a good legal, that's a good legal <laughs> answer. <laughs> yes. Well, here, here's why I say that because I do think the judge may try to split hairs and remove Nathan Wade from the case. I think Agreed. he's gone from the case, right? And the judge could say, uh, Fonnie Willis, I'm gonna keep you on this case because there has not been an actual conflict, but Nathan Wade needs to be recused. And if you won't do it, I will do it. I mean, I don't know how he's gonna phrase it. He may even try to recuse him because I believe there's an appearance of a conflict for him. And also I don't believe he was fully credible on the stand. I don't know if he's gonna go as far as that with, Fannie Willis. The problem for D.A. Willis is that if you don't believe Nathan Wade, then doesn't that make her also look not credible? Because she adopted his sworn affidavit, his affidavit that says the relationship began after he was appointed and they went Dutch on these trips. And I don't know uh, how much of that I believe because he didn't seem too credible. Although I must say, I thought she was more credible when she took the stand. Uh, and she was righteously indignant. So the judge may decide to try to split hairs here, but we'll see. No matter what, uh, there's a good segment of the population that's not going to like him for it. 
Right. You see, the problem with Nathan Wade is as soon as he would be questioning whether it would be for the prosecutors or, um, you know, in cross-examination, the only thing that jurors are going to be looking at is him and recounting the conversations about their sexual relationship, their, you know, their, their cash and so on. It's such a major distraction. I just truly don't know why he doesn't just resign himself without even uh, Judge McAfee having to make a determination. You know, I would just, I would just right. do it that Michael. way. And he could actually step back too and allow the ADA to take over you know, claiming that she doesn't want to impede on this investigation. Because rest assured, they're competent as well. Michael, this has been a self-inflicted wound. Because yeah. if the standard is, as I believe it should be adopted by the court, that you need an actual conflict, not the perception of one, then I don't believe that has been established, that there's an actual conflict. It's not like she's having a relationship with the judge or the defense lawyers. It's within someone within her own office. But the problem is, is when she and he both injected this affidavit into the court where he swore that these things were true, then it's not an issue as much about a conflict as it is about lying. And if they lied to the court, then they're going to be balanced I, and they're going to have trouble with the bar. And so because of that, I think this whole thing would have been avoided if they had come clean from the beginning, and if he had been recused, if she said, you know what, because of the appearances of impropriety, I'm recusing him, we did have a relationship, it's over now, it has no bearing on this case, the facts are the facts, and let's move on. And I think this whole thing would have been avoided. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm with you on that one. Can I move over to a different topic for a second? Because the other day, House Republicans, especially Jim Bag Jordan, they all thought that they scored this massive win by having special counsel Robert Herr come and defend his report on Biden document case. But the Democrats, as far as I'm concerned, got in quite a few good licks, too. What's your take on that whole Herr debacle? And who do you think that his testimony ended up benefiting? I thought it benefited Joe Biden because it showed that uh, when the transcript came out that Biden was not the doddering guy that the press made him out to be, that he couldn't remember dates. No, he did remember May 30th, the specific day that his son died. Now, when it came to the year, there was a little confusion, but does that disqualify you from being president? I mean, it happens to all of us, especially if you look at the context, because they said it was 2017 or or they said 2015. And he was like, whoa, 2015. Is that so? Well, yeah, that, that's an ambiguous comment that could make him think, wow, that was longer ago than it seems. So it, it's not so clear that he couldn't remember key details. In fact, the transcript would say the opposite. So I thought in that sense that Biden had the better day. Plus, I got to tell you, I was surprised that it seemed that the Republicans went after her stronger than the Democrats did, because on the Democratic side, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the prosecutor who put in these gratuitous lines about Biden's memory when he didn't have to. Meanwhile, though, on Earth 2, you had the Republicans who right. are slamming her for being this political hack who was protecting Biden. So that's what made me think, wow, this is what happens, Michael, when you try to make everyone happy. You make no one happy. The alligator is always hungry. Yeah, but I... I I would have to say, if I was going to give my opinion on it, which it's my show, so I will, uh, that the Democrats came out better on it. I thought that, you know, um, Jamie Raskin, I thought was fantastic. Steve Cohen was fantastic. Um, I thought that the questions that they posed to him and their um, recitation of this massive document that her put out that they had digested it and that they had hit the more significant points to discredit him in terms of what there are so many gratuitous knocks on President Biden for no reason at all. In fact, they, they draw a whole series of comments made by her 
about Biden's memory, whereby he said that he has a photographic recollection of certain of these events. And then right. he goes on to attack him by calling him an old man with, you know, fading recall. Well, which one is it? Right. And I'll tell you what I didn't like also. I also didn't like his demeanor. I found him to be an arrogant fuck who, you know, was sitting there rolling his eyes, whether it was Republicans or Democrats asking questions. He rolled his eyes quite a bit, like a, you know, like an elementary school kid. He didn't like the fact that he was there. He didn't like the fact that he was being questioned on his report. But hey, Robert, here's the deal. When you write something gratuitously stupid that's affecting the president of the United States and you know the divisiveness between the two sides, the Republicans and the Democrats. What did you think as special counsel was going to happen? I would have liked to have gotten an answer from him. Why did you do it? Why did you put these gratuitous comments in when they clearly were neither needed or warranted? Michael, he saw what happened to David Weiss. David Weiss was another special prosecutor appointed by Donald Trump when he was a U.S. attorney, who then was kept on by Merrick Garland to investigate Hunter Biden. And after he indicted Hunter Biden and indicted him on some controversial counts, he got attacked by the Republicans and called a traitor and called someone who is in the bag for the Biden family. And I got to believe that that had to have an imprint on Robert Hur, who is a lifetime conservative, worked for Rehnquist, appointed by Donald Trump. And so I think he included some of this gratuitous language as a way to mollify the other side. But as I said, the alligator is always hungry. And he included that language, which I thought was a step too far. Now, I get it as a prosecutor. When you make a judgment as to whether or not you should prosecute, you've got to decide whether there's a good faith belief you can get a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. So to believe that a jury is not going to find that this person had the necessary intent element, you may want to say, he has memory issues, but that's not what he did. He he went into detail about this uh, this forgetfulness about his son's uh, date of death, which really was not that accurate. That that he Biden did not uh, forget the date of his death. He got it right, May thirtieth, and then he went into well, he's just an older man with a bad memory. Whatever he wrote, which I thought was gratuitous and unnecessary. As a prosecutor, you could have done it differently without going into hundreds of pages about extraneous stuff that he knew would be used politically because, of course, we're in an election year and this is the environment we're in. Yeah. I mean, he clearly knew that they were going to. So, again, I really would have liked to have pressed him on that issue. Why, why did you do it? And the answer is crystal clear. They did it or he did it because he still wanted to remain in the good grace of Donald Trump in the event that Trump, on God forbid a million times, wins, he can have some sort of a position or a relationship to the administration. And it's, it's really shameful. And I do really hope somebody, you know, sends this to the Bar Association, because I think it's worthy of at least a reprimand. I'm not saying sanction. I'm not saying to be disbarred, but it definitely, it definitely deserves a reprimand. Well, Michael, this is what I meant about David Weiss, right? David Weiss, long career as a Republican, is now persona non grata on that side. And right. Robert Hurst saw this, and perhaps he was trying to avoid that same fate. But you know, in this environment, you can't. You try to be a prosecutor. You try to uh, just base it on the evidence of the law. And even with the gratuitous comments, even with those comments, which I did not like, he still ran afoul of the right wing and they savaged him at the hearing. Yeah, and he deserved it. So, David, you said that the Supreme Court is not going to protect us. And I, I agree with you. I think that's true. But in your opinion, is the court actively working against Democrats? Oh boy, I, I I I don't think they're in their minds actively working against Democrats. I think that they have given Trump a lot more deference than they should have. And, and what disturbs me is that when Trump wanted the uh, the Colorado case to be expedited, they gave that to him. They expedited it. 
And then when he wanted the DC election interference case to be delayed, they gave it to him. So on one end, they're rushing, and the other end, they're slowing it down, dragging their feet. And I, I don't think that Chief Justice Roberts wants his court to be seen as political. But you have Clarence Thomas still on the court making decisions who is compromised here because his wife has been involved with, was involved with January 6th. So he should not be voting on these measures, but he is. So it looks bad. Then you have Alito, who is also in that camp. And I think those are the two votes on the Supreme Court who would do what it took to help Donald Trump, but not the others. I think the others, as we've seen from other cases like Donald Trump's taxes and the election so-called fraud, that those justices that Trump himself appointed, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett, are not in the back room on everything. And, and that's why um, even in this last ruling we saw, Amy Coney Barrett said, hey, let's slow down on this uh, issue on Colorado. Let's slow down. Let's not go any farther than we need to be. So if the question is, as you asked, are they there to screw the Democrats? No, I, I don't go that far. But I do believe that they have coming in to the bench their own political biases, and it can show through their rulings. So maybe it's not intentional, but it has that effect of helping Donald Trump when you delay the election interference case in DC, which is the most likely case, that federal case that would have been heard before the election. And at the same time, you expedite the Colorado matter. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you might have heard me say on television or in the press, certainly on this podcast, and my political beatdown one as well, is that I think that the Supreme Court justices need to understand that when Donald Trump stated that on day number one, he intends to rewrite the Constitution, that Donald Trump intends to destroy our tripartite system of government, what he is destroying is the co-equal branches of government, specifically in this case, the legislative branch and the judiciary. If he is successful in doing that, and I tell everybody, I know he looks like a buffoon. He acts like a fucking buffoon. He's more clever than people want to give him credit for. If hypothetically he manages to do that because he has every single person working in government signing a loyalty pledge to him, there is no more judiciary. There is no more Supreme Court. And one of the things that Donald has done is I think he's intimidating members of the Supreme Court who realize that if hypothetically he gets back into office, that they're not on, they're not on the exclusion list for going after critics or people that have pissed him off. And I'm, I'm concerned about that too. You see, like you, despite the fact I'm disbarred, I have tremendous respect for the court and for judges, legitimate judges. I have tremendous respect for the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has taken an absolute beating in terms of reputation. When it comes to the justices, I think there's another factor at play, Michael. I think Clarence Thomas clearly does not want to be replaced by a liberal on the court. He does not want a Democrat to appoint a successor. So uh, he definitely wants Trump to remain as president or to come back as president, I should say. Oh my gosh. And then Alito for the same reasons. I think he would like to leave the court and he would definitely not resign under a Democrat unless it's forced to. So he sees, wow, if a Democrat, if, if Biden wins re-election, election, that means I have to stay on the court for another four more years to try to outlast him. And Clarence Thomas feels the same way, I believe. So I think that's another factor is that they're looking at it the same way Anthony Kennedy did, where all of a sudden he left under interesting reasons uh, when Trump was there. And, you know, the, this it's a political decision. As I said, these guys come in there, they say, well, we're originalists, we're textualists, we just follow the text. But really, a lot of their decisions, I believe, are influenced by politics and just see the Bush v. Gore ruling five to four, which was pure politics. Uh, at the time in 2000. And you know how I know that because in the ruling, they actually had a little uh, a comment, a footnote that said, uh, this ruling should never be used for precedent for anything else. It's a one-time thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree. Elevate every morning with Tommy John's second skin underwear. What you put in your pants can make or break your day. 
and the luxurious support of Second Skin guarantees everything will go smoothly. When you wear Tommy John, you're much more comfortable so you can do everything better. Tommy John's stylish and second skin underwear has dozens of comfort innovations like a supportive contour pouch and breathable, lightweight, moisture wick fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. And who doesn't need more stretch? With over 20 million pairs sold and thousands of five-star reviews, guys like me everywhere love their Tommy John's. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics like this one who raves that they are the most comfortable boxer briefs ever. There's no downside. Buy one pair and you'll never want to wear any other underwear again. Now, let me tell you why I love my Tommy John second skin underwear. It doesn't matter if you're a lefty or a righty. With Tommy John's horizontal quick draw fly, you get unparalleled unfurling access. And we all need access. And with Tommy John, the legs never ride up, the waistband never rolls down, and every pair comes with the Tommy John's trusted no wedgie guarantee. So take it from me, these second skin briefs are second to none. That's why I'm telling you, you should get Tommy John too. Plus, your most valuable assets are always covered with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee. For silky soft comfort and sophisticated style, check out Tommy John's luxurious second skin limited edition colors right now at TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. They're going fast, so hurry to TommyJohn.com slash Cohen. So let's just assume for a quick second that Biden is reelected, all right? What do you think that he should do about the court? I'm of the, I'm of the opinion, a lot of people don't like it, but I'm of the opinion, expand it. Not just expand it, but also pressure the ones that we're talking about, the old ones, to retire, right? What's your opinion? Well, politically, I don't know how he can expand it without getting 60 votes in the Senate. You need uh, to have a filibuster-proof majority. So unless you change a filibuster rule, and that's something you need. So you need to have 51 members who will go along uh, in the Senate to change a filibuster rule, and then you can expand it. So there's a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through. You know, there is no magic number in the court, Michael. It is not in the Constitution to have nine members of the Supreme Court. Right, and the Supreme Court numbers have changed up and down. In fact, I'm old enough to remember when Mitch McConnell lowered the number of the Supreme Court justices from nine to eight. Do you remember that when Scalia died? He refused to even entertain the idea of having a new justice in the last year of Obama's presidency. So he changed the number of the Supreme Court to eight, and then they added it back to make it nine uh, when uh, Trump won. So uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy going on by saying, oh, nine is the magic number. No, our, our population has grown. And the fact that they people have lived longer and you serve until you're in your, you know, you can serve 40 years. That's that not wasn't the original intent of our founders, of our uh, forefathers to have people like die on the Supreme Court at, in the 90s and to make it so political on how they retire and leave. And it's just not meant to be. And so I, I think that some reform is necessary. Maybe a term limits for justices. How about that? That mm-hmm. would How about term limits for federal that. court judges? And how about legitimate term limits for members of Congress? Because it was never the founding father's intention either that they would make a career out of politics as opposed to it being your service, your your duty to serve your fellow man. Well, I would support 40, 50 term years on the on, as members of Congress or or governor as a senator. What kind of nonsense is this? Well, look, I, I'd, su- I'd support term limits too, but the term limits were struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in a five to four vote with Clarence yeah. Thomas as a deciding vote, striking yeah, it down Clarence. because yeah, it violated in, in their eyes the Constitution. Uh, so I, I think that maybe they want to make another run at it, maybe through a constitutional amendment because it's very popular. Term limits are very popular. You see, we're talking about going to Congress, getting 60 votes in order to increase it. Let me be very clear. God forbid a billion times that Trump becomes president, he'll do whatever he wants. And he'll do it by executive order. And 
even if the executive order is not permissible, it doesn't matter because he's attempting or he would have accomplished changing the judiciary and the legislature. So therefore, you don't even have members of Congress anymore because he did away with them, except for the ones like Jim Bag Jordan, assuming he's not going to be part of the, the administration. I mean, that's how he is jumbling up our, <laughs> our you know, um, knowledge of how government works. He's going to take it and he's just going to disassemble it. Well, my mom thinks the same way. Uh, and uh, the fact that you Your say this- Your mom is a smart lady. Shout out to my mom. I try to, you know, calm her down about it because she does believe it would be Armageddon. Uh, Michael, you you know uh, the former president as well as anyone. Do you really, if he is elected, I know that you're the questioner here, but if he is elected again, the guardrails are gone. John Kelly and his team are gone. Do you really believe that our democracy is over or at least over. just wounded temporarily? Over. Over. Oh, my God. The same, to the same extent that as a result of von Schitzen pants that they managed to, you know, um, overturn, you know, the Dobbs decision, use that overturning in order to destroy 50 years of starry decisis on um, Roe versus Wade. I don't believe in our lifetime, because I think we're around the same age. Uh, I don't believe in our lifetime we're going to see a reinstatement of Roe. I do not believe that we will. You know, it's, it's very hard to get like row in place. And what it's shown is just how easy it is to destroy it. And that's what Trump is all about. He is going to wreck our system to an extent we may never even see. And I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here. I'm telling you, I know the guy and I know what he's thinking. I've been right so far almost almost every time. He wants to, he wants to make this democracy into an autocracy with him as the supreme leader, the king, the monarch, the Fuhrer. There might never be another election after 2024. What do you think about that one? Well, it doesn't give a lot of confidence when you host Viktor Orban and loud him as the ideal ruler. Uh, that, what he did in in, uh, in Hungary is to take uh a democracy and you, you wither it away. So you still have elections, but the democracy essentially has been destroyed. It's under, underpinnings have been destroyed and, and that could happen here. And that's, that's what I worry about. And uh, I, God forbid, I mean, you know, but you mentioned something very interesting about Roe versus Wade, Trump's coalition to, to be elected. He needs pro-choice women to vote for him who will care mm -hmm. more about immigration or crime when, Remember, they had a good immigration bill that that uh, Trump managed to kill in the House, yep. but he, he needs Senator Lankford. Yep. Senator Lankford, who admirably was stuck by a his gun over there, an absolutely right? conservative Republican. Yep, yeah, you saw him uh, nodding his head to Biden in the uh, State of the Union. Kudos to him. But mm -hmm. I, but you have to have pro-choice women who will vote for Trump and think that somehow that he wasn't responsible for Roe versus Wade or that nothing else will happen. There'll never be another national, never be a national abortion ban. But these are the same people who said Roe versus Wade would never be overturned. Don't worry about it. It's never going to happen. Well, now it's happened. And you see states not only trying to ban abortion entirely, but to prevent their residents from traveling across state lines to get an abortion in another state, which is blatantly unconstitutional. Well, it's constitutional if, in fact, the Constitution even exists come 2024, right? I mean, you know, come, I should say, January of 2025. It's it's a real danger. He is, as I say, possibly the single greatest danger to America's democracy that exists in at least the last 150 years. So let me ask you this then, because Trump's time in court is going to take away from his campaigning in a very significant way. What's your opinion of Trump's ongoing trials? And do you think that if he's found guilty of any more crimes, that it'll make a genuine difference in the race? The polls say there is a not insignificant part of the electorate who would bolt from Trump if he is found guilty of any of these crimes. Now, will that actually happen if he's found guilty in New York? That's the one case that will go to trial. It's supposed to go to trial this month. And that case could end up giving him prison time. But will voters care? One 
problem with that case is that it's not televised. And so you're going to get lots of misinformation about what's happening. It's going to look like a a star chamber for for the uh, the right wing. They're going to say, "Hey, this is a hidden court, and they're they're screwing me left and right." And this is a political DA who was a, a anti Trump Democrat. And will the public then buy into the verdict? Because the verdict will be from a jury of Trump's peers, and uh, we'll see. But I think that that case, even though it's the fourth out of the four as far as the strength of the cases against Trump. It doesn't mean it's a weak case. I know there's so a certain. Can, can, wait, wait, can we can we stop right there for a second? Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to put right you there, yeah. It's okay. No, no. Can we stop right there for one second? Because yeah. it's four out of four in regard to the strength of the case. I don't think that that's the best way to characterize it. I agree with you. It is four out of four of the grotesque Ill- illegalities, right? Obviously, you know, or the uh, or the the extent of the crime that's being charged, clearly attempting to overturn a free and fair election is a more grotesque abuse of the law, right? Or the January 6th insurrection or the Marilardo documents case. I grant that if we were handicapping cases, that this would clearly be the four horse in a four horse race. Yes. But this and- type of, but this type of action, these illegal actions that Alvin Bragg has brought against Trump, these are prosecuted every single day in New York. They're commonly prosecuted. They are crimes. And I don't want you to have to talk about this case because you're a key witness in that case. So, uh, But I'll say this. The reason why I say fourth out of four, it doesn't mean it's a weak case. It just means that if you look at the others, we can agree the Mar-a-Lago documents case is the strongest case. I mean, he really doesn't have any defense there. They got him dead to rights in that case. Uh, the number two case, I think, is the election interference case in D.C. that was built for speed. Uh, those Jack Smith federal prosecutions, they get like a 97, 98 percent conviction rate. Uh, and he's got a D.C. jury. I, I think that case is strong against him. And then when it comes to Georgia, which is now imperiled, that mm-hmm. case is strong, too, because you got Trump on tape. That's something you have. Uh, that's an advantage where you have him on tape by me, 11,780 votes, and you have so much evidence, and the and the RICO charges could put you into prison for years. The issue I have with the New York case is not that it's a weak case. It's that there it's a it's a novel legal theory to take it from a misdemeanor to a a felony. So right now you have all these misdemeanor charges of of the business records, of uh, falsifying business records. To take it to a felony, it's got to lead to concealing another crime. And what is that other crime? Well, Alvin Bragg doesn't have to tell us yet. And he hasn't specified it in the pleadings yet, but it looks like, based on what he's saying, it's going to be campaign finance violations to try to have the election uh, decided without knowing about this important fact, concealing it. And that's something that should have been revealed. So that's why I think it's fourth out of four because it is a bit novel when you say the crime that it leads to is a federal crime and we're going to adjudicate it in state court. Not impossible. In fact, I think it's still not a weak case, but I think four out of four for the reasons I just said. And I and I agree with you on that. I just think like the Georgia case, like the um, January 6th is, I think, tougher, but um, I believe that the documentary evidence and the corroborating testimony by the various various witnesses are going to show um, exactly what took place here. But you're right; I won't get too deep into the weeds uh, on this, and I'll move on to your state of Florida. Right? The practices of Ron DeSantis still popular in Florida, or are the culture wars and Moms for Liberty getting old? DeSantis hurt himself by running for president and uh, running afoul of the MAGA movement. He went against their leader, and so he took a hit from that. And then certain measures that he has pushed are very unpopular. The six-week abortion ban, which he got signed into law Mm -hmm. right before he really uh, took off on the campaign trail. He wanted that to help his campaign, and has backfired because very few people support that in Florida. And then when it comes to book bans, no one likes book bans. I don't, I don't know anyone, not even the right wing likes book bans. That's very unpopular. The don't say gay bill that was passed, uh, they just reached a settlement that's going to mollify its effects. 
but uh, that that's controversial. Not as unpopular though as the other two. And then there's the other one, the big one. He went to war with the most popular icon in Florida. You know who that is, Michael? Disney. Mickey Mouse. That's right. Yep. And Mickey don't play, you know? So uh, Mickey Mouse uh, took a bite out of DeSantis, and it's hurt his popularity. Now, he's still Florida has a now 800,000 Republican advantage over Democrats. That has that has grown so much since in four years. Four years ago, Democrats had like a 300,000 vote advantage. Now it's 800,000 the other way. And so DeSantis has succeeded in making Florida this MAGA Petri dish where you're attracting a lot of red voters from blue states down to our state. And it's changing Florida dramatically, even here in Palm Beach County, where it was a very blue county, less so now. But here's a silver lining if you're a Democrat watching this in another part of the country. As Florida has attracted a lot of these hardcore Republican voters, it has made the rest of the country bluer. And I think that's one of the several reasons why the red wave of 2022 did not materialize. Mm -hmm. All it takes is taking away 10,000 super Republican voters from Michigan. That's a game changer. You know, that's what's been happening, I think, around the country. Yeah. I, you know, I, I agree with you. I'm not so sure exactly how red Florida actually is. You know, I acknowledge that people are moving into Florida on a daily basis from all over the country. A lot of the people that are coming there are actually Democrats. And you know, when you're in the voting booth and you need to make the decision in terms of who you think is better for this country, which one of these, as my, my mom would say, which one of these two Altacockers, you know, are, you know, are, you know, better for the country? There's not even a question here. One of one of whom is an empathetic, a true American who really wants to see all Americans succeed. And then you have the other guy, the orange-crusted Mandarin Mussolini, who wants to become an autocrat, the king, the monarch, the Fuhrer, etc., and is willing to, and again, I don't want people to think this is being hyperbolic and it's just me sort of shit all over Donald. It's not the point. These are his words. And all I do is take his words. I put it into an order because Donald has no order. I didn't say it. Donald did. I'm not making it up when Donald said that he's going to rewrite the Constitution. He wants to be a dictator on day one. You know, he wants to destroy the tripartite system, that he's taking credit for Roe versus Wade, you know, that there are other things that he intends to do as soon as he's in, including uh, agreeing with MAGA Mike Johnson when he says that he wants to see America become a white Christian nationalist country again. First and foremost, we've never been that ever in our history, but that's what they want. So then I say to Muslims in Michigan who are angry at Joe Biden because of the Israel-Hamas war, okay, and you have every right to feel the way you want to feel. But remember on the very first bill that Donald Trump put out, in January of 2017 was not an immigration ban. It was a Muslim ban, all right? Plain and simple. And now you got MAGA Mike Johnson who legitimately wants to do an inquisition and that if you are Jewish, if you're Muslim, if you're Hindu, either you convert to Christianity or what? They kill you? They deport you? What do they do? It's a nightmare. Yeah, for, for anyone who's going to vote against Joe Biden because he's not uh, supporting the Palestinians enough, remember, elections are about choices. As Joe Biden likes to say, don't judge me against the almighty, judge me against the alternative. And you have Biden versus Donald Trump, who has said that, you know, he wants to reinstate the uh, the Muslim ban and, so, and, and, and start rounding up. <laughs> Right. I mean, so if, if for those, I know there are some saying, well, they got to, you know, get Biden out. So then the Democratic Party will then change to support uh, Palestinians more. Those people do not understand how politics works. If Joe Biden is not in the office, uh, 
things will get much worse for them <laughs> and and the party will suffer and the country uh, will be irreparably changed. And so, look, you know, I, I disagree with them on so many levels, not to mention their uh, their their description of what's going on in Gaza. But even if uh, they are uh, have these sincere beliefs to vote against Biden, to, to oust Biden over them is like shooting yourself in the foot. It's like doing the opposite of what is in your interests. Yeah, as they say, it's cutting off your nose to spite your face. Can we talk a quick second about Israel? Because sure. Hamas is holding up, um, you know, they're, they're holding up the aid to the people of Gaza, right? I mean, Hamas is doing this. Of Netanyahu, of course, needs to keep the war going or he'll have to face his own personal consequences. So how are they going to have a ceasefire? And how is it that the what, what do the Democrats, what does Biden and this administration need to do in order to explain this to the section of the American people that no matter what you say, they just have a false impression? You know, it, just just bottom line is this. Israel was attacked on October 7th. They were attacked by terrorists. Uh, babies were burned alive. Uh, women were raped. And people who claimed to... Uh, support, you know, the women's rights and LGBTQ rights. They're supporting the terrorists, in, in this case, the ones who attacked Israel. They're thinking that the no noble uh, warriors are the individuals who would literally shoot them in the head if they ever sh showed up in Gaza themselves. Where the largest gay rights parade outside of the Western Hemisphere is in Tel Aviv. So it makes no sense. And as far as what should happen next, I'm not a fan of Netanyahu. I think his days are numbered as, as a leader there. And uh, the hope is that they're able to find some sort of government that can govern Gaza, that can uh, that can protect Palestinians from the internal warfare that seems to be happening when this big vacuum is occurring with while right. Hamas is being destroyed. Because really, the fact that Israel has not gone into Rafah tells me that the uh, the main part of the military operation is over. It's now seemingly that they're doing uh, smaller incursions to go after the terrorists instead of the massive bombings that they did at the beginning. So all that said, uh, like I'm, I, I I know that I don't stand with the Bernie Sanders of the world who just lie uh, through his teeth about how Israel is committing war crimes while he forgets about Hamas putting their military under schools and in hospitals. That's a war crime. So I stand with John Fetterman. I stand with Joe Biden and other Democrats who continue. And what about, and what about the fact that there's still hostages that are sitting there? Oh, you want to end? You want to ceasefire? Release the hostages. And then if Israel continues to act, then you could say, hey, they're acting improperly. But there are Israeli citizens and Israel will do everything in its, in its capability to get them back. Come hell or high water. You know, they, it's just that's just how that's just how they intend to run this thing you know i say to everybody i ask them this question which is imagine if this happened in america and let me just give as an example you know a bunch of kids are at school in texas or on the southern border and they fly they fly over from mexico right uh and they do exactly this what would be a reasonable response that americans would want for this heinous act where they cut off women's breasts and use them as soccer balls. They, they burn, they burn, you know, babies alive. They do all the things, the rape, the torture, just the absolute murder of innocent people that are just doing what? Enjoying a music festival? What would Americans expect the retribution to look like? And then, then just change the name of America to Israel, and then change whether it's Mexico, whatever it might be, whoever you want to pick and choose to Hamas. What would be a fair and reasonable response? Exactly. Exactly. There are hostages and there were people slaughtered from the music festival. This looks like, the people at the music festival look like a lot of these college protesters who are now protesting uh, Israel's response to the most heinous attack on Jews since the Holocaust. Uh, it just it 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 doesn't make any sense, but it shows 
that there is a lack of education on the facts of what's actually going on, the history of the Middle East. No, Israel is not, the Jews are not colonizers in Israel. They've been there uh, for thousands of years. They were there before Islam became a religion. And yet people celebrate the birth of Jesus on on December 25th, on Christmas Day. Well, that was a Jewish guy in in Israel. What would uh, now it would be considered the West Bank? So, come on, uh, just look at the facts, look at geography, look at history. Uh, but I guess competing against a 40 second TikTok video, you know, can't be done. Yeah, I totally agree. So, look, you know, uh, the hour goes by very quickly here on Maya Culpa, and I have kind of like a uh, you know, final question. It's kind of like a little bit of a doozy, right? As of Tuesday, the presidential nominees are now official. It's Biden from two, right? It's almost like Rocky two or Creed two or the Godfather part two. Just a rematch. It's a Biden Trump rematch, plain and simple. And the campaigns have already gotten underway. But what do you think of the two campaigns so far? I mean, their tone and message could not be more different than one another. Who do you think that the American people will ultimately gravitate to? I'm an optimist. I, I do think that uh, Joe Biden will win re-election. I, I do think that there are certain uh, things that do that people, the public, really does uh, that do they do care about. There's a red line: democracy, uh, reproductive rights. Democrats have outperformed in every election since the Dobbs decision. Why would that stop now? All the polls that we've seen have not reflected the actual voting in all the primary states. The polls that showed Trump would be destroying Nikki Haley, they were overinflating that. Similarly, Biden does better than we've seen in the polling. In every special election we've seen, Democrats do better. So I, I just think that that's gonna continue. Plus, the thing that you would say about Biden, the big negative they had was that he's too old and he's senile. Well, you saw what happened at the State of the Union. I think that helps rewrite the narrative. Then you say, well, inflation is too high. Well, inflation has come down dramatically. You say, well, the economy isn't good. That's not true. Economy has really picked up. So the last thing they have is the border. And what the Republicans did in killing this very conservative, very strong border mm -hmm. bill in the House gives Biden a way to say, nah, the border is something that I tried to fix. The Republicans stopped it. And now I think that means that Biden has the better of the argument on every issue. Will it matter? I still believe in my heart that issues matter. So I think that Biden will win. You know, and I also think at some point in time, I think the nepotism that we see around Donald is very damaging to him. And I'm referring, of course, to now the takeover of the RNC by Lara Trump. You know, the other day at mar a -Lardo, they were having some sort of a, a puppy money drive or something. They're always asking for money. I mean, it's unbelievable. And if it's not Donald asking, it's Don Jr., it's Ivanka, it's Jared, it's Lara and Eric, and you name it. I mean, it's like the, they are the great grifting family. What I found to be the funniest thing is that um, at this sort of um, event that they were hosting, there were tables upon tables of items that you could just buy, including handbags and so on. Do you know that the handbags that they were selling at Mar-a-Lago were all counterfeit? They were selling fake Hermes and Prada and Chanel and Gucci and you name it. They're, they're, it's like It was like fucking Canal Street here in Manhattan. you know. And I can't believe that that has not been made into a bigger issue. But the issue that I find incredibly repulsive is the fact that Lara Trump, who has absolutely zero experience in any of this as now a co-chair of the RNC, and I think this is going to really backfire uh, on, on Donald, all the money that the RNC is going to raise is expected to be used solely for one purpose. And that is to ensure the re-election of Donald J. Trump. And those are Laura Trump's words, not mine. So my question to you is being a guy who understands politics and campaigns and races, what happens to these down-ballot Republicans? The ones that Donald's going to be asking for their support when they can't get any assistance from the RNC because every single dollar that comes in there is going 
solely to one candidate. What about everybody else? I think it's a really good point, Michael, because when people say, look at the polls, Trump is ahead. Well, if you think Trump's going to win in November, that means you also are, have probably not considered the fact that there's already a very large monetary advantage that Biden has over Trump. And the fact that Trump has four criminal cases hovering over his head and multiple civil cases means that there are a lot of legal fees. And now with the uh, MAGA takeover of the RNC, you're going to see some or a lot of that money transferred over to pay legal fees. I mean, there's a way they can do it. They can say, no, it's not going to happen, but money is fungible. And so you have this monetary advantage and they have disarray in state parties around the country. Look what happened in the Arizona Republican Party with the hidden yep. recording. So you have that as a problem. Then you have a dysfunctional national party. So you, And you have the fact, and you brought this up earlier, that Trump has to go to the trial in New York, he has to be there, and he has to be if it goes to trial in Washington, D.C., which could happen right before the election. Then you have all these other distractions, civil cases over his head. So if you think that Trump is going to win based on a poll today, you're probably not considering all these other factors that I just mentioned, not including, by the way, the Dobbs decision, reproductive rights, and all these other things that are now moving in Biden's favor. Yeah. So, Dave... Thank you so much for joining me on Maya Culpa, Dave Arenberg. Appreciate, love watching you on television. I like, I, what I really appreciate is the concise, you know, um, legal response to um, all the questions that are constantly posed, you know, to you. So I thank you for joining me on Maya Culpa. Thank you for making us all smarter. Thanks for having me, Michael. And go Canes. Yes, go Canes. <laughs>